And never also never ever get stuck in the question. If you did what I just, if you did what I just said to do and you don't know the answer, pick something, guess at it, mark it, and come back to it. Don't leave a blank. Okay? Pick something, guess at it if you have to, your best choice. <coughs> right? Don't leave a blank. Mark it and come back. Cause if you leave it empty and that clock goes up and that clock goes off, it's automatically wrong. If you guess, you might get a 25% shot at getting it right. That's true. Right? And just come back. to you had enough time to end the test, come back to the ones you marked off. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah, so don't try to fry your brain on one question because you got like a whole bunch of questions left over. You're, you're going to be mentally tired. Yeah. A damaged filling neck can cause a hard start. Right, a modified filling neck can cause a hard. St I mean, a damaged filling neck can cause a hard fuel refill situation similar to a plug evap vent. Right, somebody if somebody modifies the filling neck operation or do something to it, it can cause a hard refill. Right, what I mean by that is this: I see it can actually a situation where the vacuum hose we talked about. This hole's gonna be here. We hooked up wrong, right? I plugged off a connector wrong. If it's hooked up wrong and it causes pressure in this tank, you're gonna have a hard time fitting gas in this car. If somebody modified that hose. This hose, or this hose right here, or this line right here, right? You have a hard time fitting gas in this vehicle. Now, I do remember an ASC test asking about this diagram, this holes right here. I remember, I, was, I said, okay, it could be this one or this one. I've been trying to remember that question, how it was worded. So I don't yeah. know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so it's hard to remember the question because you, kind of, you try and it's hard. And remember, here's the vent also on this. They can modify this too. This, remember, this is the vent. Remember, the vent relieved the gas tank, the pressure. So if this hose also is modified or damaged, it could cause a heart refill if there's pressure in this tank. I remember the vent released the pressure in the tank. So if this line is modified or damaged. You can have a hard time putting gas in the tank also. Uh -huh. or, or doing a refill. Dinosaur trouble codes, DTCs, uh, DTC, just leads you to the area you need to check it. Doesn't indicate the problem. Okay, and this one says locate relevant service information. That means a code does not mean that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And don't fall for that. Just like that last map sensor example we just showed you. Read the information and see and look at the parameters and find out what's out of parameter. And a lot of times, switching the ASC test, you have to use the pamphlets they give you. That's why you should understand where they're located that pamphlet before you get in there. Take that test. You might, you're might going to have to refer back to that pamphlet. This one? That blue pamphlet, yeah. I can't see it. I don't got you on the screen. Oh. Let me see it. See it? Yeah, that one. Exactly, yeah. That one. A vacuum and wiring diagram. Understand how to read a vacuum diagram and which components are tied to each other and how that affects the emission drawability. That's basically what I just said about the EVAP diagram I just showed you. Examples of a vacuum line to the EGR damage will increase NOx. Map sensor for collapsed holes can increase CO. Our, our misrouted holes also can increase CO. Review how to read the wiring diagrams, which is going to go over because we're going to go over that composite view of the wiring diagram, which that's a must. On the ASC test, that's a must to understand that diagram. And keep in mind, here's the other thing also. Keep in mind, everybody, when they look at the wiring diagram, they always look at the power source. The ground side is just as important, right, as the power side. How to switch on and off. 
it's a if a, it's a uh, low side driver, a high side driver. We're gonna go over that too. But understand that diagram and how the circuit's controlled is very important on the ASC test, ASC L1 test. On the wiring diagram, isolate the circuit and take notes of every component involved in that circuit. Even though you see a whole bunch of stuff in the circuit, usually in a circuit, it's only one component. You just gotta isolate it. I'm gonna show you how to do that also. I understand electrical component and Understanding electrical, electrical is important and necessary when it comes to passing the ASC L1 test. Remember, the ground side of the circuit is just as important as the voltage feed side of the circuit. Understand Ohm's law and how it can affect a circuit. We're talking about voltage drop, resistance, grounds, shorted, pull up and pull down circuits. Because believe it or not, a bad ground can cause a P0171 code. I, I, a, a, a high voltage drop across an injector could cause a misfire. Become familiar with the system on the vehicle being in service and diagnose. Understand the system. A better diagnostic approach can be undertaken and correct and the correct test procedures applied. Failure to understand the system can lead to an incorrect diagnosis or wrong answer. Understand the correct diagnostic path to follow. Here's the thing, what they mean by this. You can't diagnose a system if you don't know how it works. You know what I mean? You can't diagnose an EGR valve if you don't know how an EGR valve works. You can't diagnose a MAP sensor like you just did on that previous one, which is really good, if you didn't know how it worked. You did, like the EGR, you said it's 50% open. If you didn't know how that circuit worked, you would say, oh, I got a bad map sensor. But you knew that the map sensor should be zero at idle, right, with no command. And the map voltage, but you didn't know the map voltage was high, but you didn't, but you, you didn't relate the two together until, until you figured it out, right? So understanding the circuit to diagnose it is important. Now it says here, use the specifications found in a flow chart in the ASC test guide they give you. Determine, this is important too, I remember using this. Determine the minimum and maximum allowable values. I remember using that a couple of times on ASC tests. Right, with the minimum, remember anything under, any solenoid under the minimum is a short. Anything over the maximum is high resistance. And obviously an OL, our infinity symbol, if the circuit is open. If you see this, you open out a component, and you see this, our sideways are a, are a one, these are different meters. OL, or ouch, it says ouch also. These are, there's three different meters. Our sideways eight. All these means are open component. It all depends on what meter you're using. Okay. I've never seen that ouch one, but yeah, that's an old one. <laughs> I believe you. Yeah, all these mean that component is open. Okay. That's an open circuit. Yes. Now here's a, a dying, here is a, uh, diagnostic yeah, determine the diagnostic procedure. Here's an example. This vehicle is, this vehicle has a high speed surge with no diagnostic trouble codes. It's running a Richard Cruise at 40, 50, 40 to 50 miles per hour. High fuel pressure could cause this condition, or could it be a mass airflow sensor? Now, usually, a mass airflow sensor goes lean. Yeah. It usually doesn't go rich. It can happen, though. I've never seen one go rich, but it could happen. High fuel pressure, uh, uh, sorry, a fuel pressure gauge was attached to the vehicle and, test, and, a, test, and a test route was uh, performed at 40, 50 miles an hour. Now, you notice what they did here? The example here? 
The problem was at 40, 50 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't check this car at idle. It was checked at 40 to 50 miles an hour. Okay? You go back to the point of the problem. Okay, it makes no sense. It makes no sense picking an answer, a diagnosing situation at idle when the problem is at 40, 50 miles an hour. Okay. The pressure was normal at idle. All right. See. The pressure here was normal at idle, 30, 35, which is good. But the surgeon began at 40 miles an hour. That's when it increased to 72 PSI. All right, that's when it increased. And here's a graph of that short-term, short-term fuel trim, bank one and bank two, bank one O2 sensor, Bank 202 sensor. Now the first half of this, is the first half of this, look at this. All this is normal. That's normal. The second half of this picture, I said it's normal because it's driving, so it's not going to stay the same. You accelerate, decelerating, yeah. that's why you see up and down lines like that. Now, now, now look at this. For some reason, it went rich. That's the O2 sensors. They plotting this out, and it went rich. At the same time, my short-term fuel trim took a nose dive to try to fix it. Remember my short-term my. Sh my short-term fuel term job is to bring the O2 sensor back into control. You can see when it stayed rich that long, my short-term fuel term tried to take control of it. Mm -hmm. Try to fix the problem. Then all of a sudden it stopped surging and my O2 came back to life. It went lean based off of this signal here because I'm trying to make it go lean. Then the next one went lean afterwards. It should have went lean at the same time. I guess one of these sensors is a little lazy. Right, so the problem is right here though. When it surged, it went high and stuck there for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Then, it, then right here, it stopped. So, but right here, it happened. It happened. I try to fix it. the computer. Try to fix it. That's when it was surging. Then, when the surging stopped, remember at this point right here. It's a command and turn it's a command at the injectors to lean it out. So when the surging stop, you see that command right here. The O2 went straight lean. Based off that command, cause that's when the problem stopped. So it's an intermediate problem. The problem with this was a bad fuel pressure regulator. Right, it was sticking. At higher speed, sometimes it would stick. It caused a rich condition. So they changed the pressure regulator and took care of the problem. So this was a sticky pressure re fuel pressure regulator. Uh -huh. On this one, it says use the appropriate diagnostic procedure here also. Information on condition that causes a certain DTC to set may, is, may be essential when troubleshooting a specific DTC. Remember, the monitor runs a test to confirm the operation of an emission control unit. If the initial criteria isn't performed, that circuit isn't tested. And right here, this we got down here, is the conditions for the initial criteria to run. This used to be a book. I got in the classroom. I have a bunch of books like this called Genome. Right? They they show those are old books, but they show you a new criteria to get the monitor to run. Right here, the code is P zero four thirty. Right? 
catalyst system efficiency below threshold bank two and here are the DTCs and P0 P1419 set see now what this is showing you here for this cap monitor to run to set this code P0430 mm -hmm. we can't have any codes in the system Engine run time over 330 seconds. Engine speed between 1,000 and 1,300 RPMs and closed loop. This is, this is an error criteria for this monitor to run. 1,300 1, RPMs and closed loop at part throttle. ECT signal 170 to 230 degrees Fahrenheit. IAT signal from 20 degrees to 180 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Fuel level over 15. Engine load from 15 to 35%. And fur temperature of O2 sensor, 2-2 over 900 degrees Fahrenheit, vehicle speed between 5 and 70 miles an hour, and the PCM detected that the switch rate of the O2 sensor was very close to the switch rate of 2-1. Uh, 2-2 two one. Two, two and 2-1. Two mm -hmm. The switch rate had to be the same, meaning it switched about the same time. That's the enable criteria for this cat monitor run to test this cat. Once it met those criteria, it ran a test on the cat. When it ran a test on the cat, it fell for P0430. If the enable criteria is not run, this is during the drive cycle, if it's not met, that monitor won't run the code won't set. And here's the other thing with this one also. You can have something called a blocking code, meaning I can have a code for any one of these things. Say TPS. This is TPS right here. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's say this car ran, let's say this car was driven a long time with this code in the system. And the customer never fixed it. But during that time, the cat went bad. Guess what? Like we just said, this cat monitor won't run because we had this code in the system. Mm -hmm. It's gonna block it. So once we, so once the customer gets this fixed and it's taken care of, you clear, the customer clear the codes, I mean, sorry, the technician clear the codes and get the customer back the car. They go drive the car for a day or two and the light comes back on. But this time it comes back on for this. Uh -huh. Right? And not this. And the reason and the reason it came on for this, it came on for this, because it was blocked due to this. The monitor didn't run. Right? The monitor did not run because this was in the system. Once this was fixed, and there was no present codes in the system anymore. Now we do a cat tip. Now the cat monitor run like, like normal, right? But when it ran, he said, "Oh, it failed also." After it ran two good trips, now it's gonna set a code for this one. That make any sense? It's called a blocking code. Okay. That makes sense to that. Does that make sense? So it's because there's outstanding codes, so until those are cleared, it won't run the monitor exactly yes it won't run the monitor right so that means that cat never gets tested the monitor doesn't, if the monitor doesn't run the cat doesn't get tested gotcha. right so you may or may not this vehicle may or may not have a problem with the cat you never you ain't gonna find out until the monitor runs And the monitor could stop running because of a, a code in the system like it's showing you here. Now let's say the monitor, none of your codes was in the system and the monitor ran and it failed because of this. And it did fail because of this. Here are some of the things that can cause that, right? Right, Cali converter has failed. Check for damage or dis discoloration. Check for air leaks. An exhaust manifold could cause a false cat code. The vacuum leaks. Now, now what they mean by that is this: the cat is the cat was made to hold so much oxygen. You put too much in there, it's going to come out the back, and it can come out and the back O2 sensor is going to pick it up, and you get a false O2. Uh, sorry, you get a false catalytic converter code. This is just because too much oxygen went into the cat. Uh -huh. That could be uh, that could be called a vacuum leak, a car running lean, or exhaust exhaust manifold leak. 
fuel pressure, a O2 sensor is a good cause for it too. I'm going to show you a picture one later on. A lazy O2 sensor could cause a cat cold. Front load two sensor or rail two sensor is contaminated with fuel, right? Because of uh, bad gas. Somebody used silicone, like for <clears throat> that's that yellow gorilla snot you use on gaskets, and not O2 sensor safe. Can also cause the O2 O2 sensor to go bad, and get a false cat cold. Understand the data determined. Understand the data, determine the relative importance of the data you are reading. If a malfunction indicator lamp is lit, one or more DTCs are almost certainly present. You would need to understand how to troubleshoot the DTCs and make it the highest priority when diagnosing a DTC relating to a symptom of a car. OV2 systems have interaction and components and their and their monitors. Now basically what this means is this. If I had a code for a misfire, O2 sensor, and catalytic converter, the part you're gonna diagnose first is the misfire. That's a that's has higher priority than the cat at this situation, in this scenario right now, I just gave you. Because a misfire will kill a cat, and a misfire will set a false, a false O2 sensor code, like P0171. So you take care of the misfire first. Or let's say we had a car running extremely rich, and a P04, and a catalytic converter code. You take care of the rich condition first, then you worry about the cat afterwards. This, this, is what this, mean, this is what this means. Determine, determine which one has the higher, it has, is more important to diagnose first, to go with first. A blocking code preventing another mountain from running. You know what that means? Oh, gosh, come on. Well, we just talked about it. Exactly, now, yes. I the want, table, the monitor. Yes, I, that's why I said that, see, do you remember? You're exactly right, what well, we just got finished talking about. It may be necessary to run all monitors and recheck for codes once a component is replaced on the OB2 vehicle. That's what we just talked about. If I change that TPS, it might be a good idea to do a drive cycle on that car to make sure no penny codes show up to prevent any further problems with the customer. Mm -hmm. It's OB, I got 3,000, it's OBD2, uh, the misprint here. <laughs> Now, here's a good example about blocking code. I like using this as an example. This is out, oh, this is the Cali converter. Mm -hmm. This is the back one. This is the front one. That's downstream and upstream. Right. This is B1S1. It's B1. S2. And remember also, the one with the highest number is always in bag. On that same bag. But you can have B1S3, that means that's the one in the back. And one and two is in front. So the one with the highest number is the one that's always in the back. And this one always has a zirconium oxygen sensor. This could be a zirconium or titanium or air fuel sensor. Anyway, what this says. So this is the Cali converter. How the Cali converter monitor runs is based, is simple. The back O2 sensor, here's your lab scope. The back O2 sensor is high. Steady. And steady. Mm -hmm. Right? The front one is switching. Yeah, it starts to fluctuate. Yes. Right? And it compares the two. I'm sorry, the PCM, when the monitor runs the test on the CAD, it compares the two signals. And we'll see a 70% difference between the front and back. What that means is, if the front O2 sensor switches 10 times, this got to be less than 7 times in the back. 
right? A 70% difference. So this switch is 10, this gotta be less than seven. Now, let's go back to the blocking code. Since the computer uses its front node 2 sensor to check the CAD, if we get a code for O2 sensor lazy, the monitor for the cat gonna do what? It's gonna do what? The monitor for the cat, it'll be disabled, right? Yes, it's gonna be disabled. And the reason why is because it can't trust this sensor because I have a code for it. If I have a code for this front sensor, I can't rely on it. So it's gonna disable the cat monitor from running until this is fixed. That's called a blocking code. It will block that monitor from running until it's fixed. And that's, I think that's the most easiest one to understand because everybody knows how the cat monitor runs. And use the front one, right? And use the front O2 sensor compared to the back one to see if the cat's working. So basically the downstream tell you, tells you how the cat's performing. Yes, right. exactly. The downstream tells you how the cat's perform exactly. That's exactly right. Here's a power train. Oh, sorry. Here's a no, no. Tell the difference between a power train and mechanical electric, and electrical problems. Remember, a computerized engine control depend on a mechanically sound engine. A mechanically failure can mimic electronic problems. Many DTCs that appear in the computer system can actually be caused by mechanical failure. An example would be a map sensor. How can that happen? Incorrect valve timing causing low vacuum, yeah. right? I've seen that a few times. Somebody put a timing belt wrong, wrong, or a jump and go back and goes low, you get a map sensor code. All right, here's a common one too. A uh, electrical issue would be a high voltage drop on the ground side of a circuit. Get a high voltage drop on the ground side of the circuit. Guess what? They're gonna give you a code for that sensor, not the ground. That's an electrical problem. Mm -hmm. Engine coolant level can cause the engine coolant temperature (ECT) sensor to warm up incorrectly. This will cause an erratic signal from the ECT sensor and will affect the air fill mixture. Obviously, because it works off of coolant. This will affect the drawability and fuel economy problems, as well as increased CO and AC emissions. High resistance, high resistance, cold engine, more fuel. Remember, this is an NTC sensor, negative temperature coefficient thermistor. Yeah. On a cold car, it has high resistance. That tells the computer that the vehicle is cold. I'm oh, sorry. Let me back up. On a cold car, high resistance is going to be a high voltage drop. That high voltage drop tells the computer the car is cold. Add more fuel. As the car warms up, the resistance drops, right, on a high engine. A lower voltage drop. That tells the computer to decrease the fuel. So obviously, if the, obviously if the coolant mixture is off or wrong and affects the coolant sensor, you can have an emissions problem based off of that. A, a good example, somebody took the thermostat out the car, right? And a, a, one of the common things that, especially not over the two, that at higher RPMs, it goes in a closed loop. At idle, it goes in open loop and runs richer because at higher RPM, the engine gets hot, it keeps the cooling sensor warm. As it cools down, as, I'm sorry, as you come to idle, it cools down because the coolant runs so, flows so fast, it cools down and goes in an open loop and goes rich. Yeah. An engine that runs hot may tend to knock, which in turn signals the PCM to retard the timing. That's from the knock sensor. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
And over here, energy can also have incomplete combustion, which will result in high hydrocarbons from the, from the tailpipe. An engine that runs hot, but, oh, I did this already. Did I got a slide twice? Yeah, I got it twice, don't I? Huh. If the cooling system problem prevents the engine from reaching normal operating temperature, the engine could run rich based on a poor input from the PCM. Now also keep this in mind also, a poor input be, also be due to resistance on the connector, corrosion on the connector, a bad connection on the connector. Any resistance, any increased resistance on that cooling sensor will cause a, the PCM to think the car is cold and increase the pulse width and add more fuel. Verify the engine integrity before attempting to diagnose the problem. There is no code for a bad engine, <laughs> right? So you can have a misfire because of lack of compression, burnt valve, vacuum leaks. Yeah. So understand vacuum tests, mm -hmm. uh, compression tests, cranking and running compression tests, cylinder leakage tests. All these, you gotta, all these should be checked during diagnosing. Obviously that vacuum would be like 17 to 21 inches of vacuum. Uh, compression, obviously, without comp good compression, you're gonna have a misfire. Yeah. Cranking and running compression, meaning. Well, what do you use those tests for to identify what, you, what sort of mechanical you, problem, the you, cranking and running? You know what? Relative compression is more like a cranking amperage test. I, I read that wrong. I thought I just said compression test. Relative compression test is more like a. Uh, Almost like an amperage test. While taking out the spark plugs, you crank the car over with an amp meter and see if the amperage being pulled evenly across each cylinder. Because if you have a weak cylinder or a cylinder not pulling compression, your amperage is going to be much lower. And you see it on a relative compression test. Now, cranking to a cranking compression test, it's like your standard compression test. All right, your car is running rough. That's why when you check the engine out, you stick a compression gauge in the cylinder and do a compression test. Yeah. Now, a running compression test. A running compression test is basically, now you still got the same compression gauge in the car, but this time what's happening is the car is running at part throttle and you bleed out, you take the compression gauge, bleed out the first puff, hold it, hold it at part throttle, and in theory, it should be half of the compression, <coughs> it should be half of the static com cranking compression test. For example, if I have a cranking compression at 150 PSI, my running compression test should be about 75, plus or minus, I think it's 10, 15%. All right, if you got anything higher, you got exhaust cam load that's worn out and it's recompressing the air fuel mixture, not getting out the cylinder. Anything lower, much lower or much higher, anything much lower is that the cam intake cam load, I'm sorry, the cam intake cam load is worn out and not getting the compressed air in. And then the air fuel mixture in on air in to compress it. But guess what? The compression test will still be good. All right, on a, a, a running compression test that's too high. Either you got an exhaust cam load that's worn out or you got carbon behind the exhaust valve and the valve not opening enough to let out the burnt exhaust fumes and it's recompressing it. The same thing with the intake side, if it's too low. Either the cam load on the intake side is so worn out, the intake valve not opening up to let the air fuel mixture in. Or you got carbon on the intake valve not letting it come in. Either way, they could call, you could see that in a running compression test. Now, I was at cylinder leakage test is based off of, I have low compression, I need to find out where it's coming from. Do you, do, so you do a cylinder leakage test. I like a, that's part of the A8 test, ASE A exam. Like you, 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 put the, you put the cylinder on top of the center, you put air in the cylinder, and you just listen. 
Yeah, right. Sure. So yeah, the, the yeah. Holes in the, the coolant reservoir, you know, you, you have a head gasket or something. Exactly. Or if it hisses on the tailpipe, it's the, um, the exhaust valve that's not seating. Exactly. At the tailpipe, it's the exhaust valve. Exactly. And if you hear it at the, um, the fill port for the engine oil. Uh huh. Or, or, yeah, if you hear it at the, at the. Yeah, the oil cap or the dipstick. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. That's, um, that's um rings exactly that's your rings by passing through the rings yes be a combustion chamber um the jacket walls yes how about um, come to how about it's coming to the throttle body if it's coming to the throttle body that's an admission now that's either sticking or or um right that's your that's your intake valve yes yeah, intake valve. yes An engine with a burnt valve and low compression may result in a lean condition also, right? So you got a car with a burnt valve, that's additional oxygen coming out the cylinder. Mm -hmm. It's going to be picked up by the O2 sensor. Or, or the four, four or five gas analyzer, you see high O2. Remember, you can't get high CO unless you have combustion. Okay? You have to have combustion to have high CO. Right, you don't have combustion, you're not gonna have high CO. This condition may be indicated by higher than normal O2 readings on the four gas, the four gas exhaust analyzer, or by continuous lean exhaust signal from the exhaust O2 sensor. And later on, I'm gonna show you how you can see a misfire by reading the O2 sensor. Leaky or burnt valves will not, affect, will not affect the airflow, but it can cause incomplete combustion <laughs> by not sealing the combustion chamber. Right. A leaky intake valve can also reduce cylinder pressure and lead to incomplete combustion, and it can affect the intake flow. Incomplete combustion can lead to excessive oxygen leaving the combustion chamber into the exhaust into the exhaust, past oxygen sensor, still into a vacuum lead. That's where you get the code P0171. So what's happening is when you're on your com compression uh, phase, it's not sealing the combustion chamber. So some of that mixture is exiting to the exhaust, right? Yeah, yeah, you're not having a, 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 a complete combustion. So when you don't have when you don't have complete combustion, the O2 doesn't burn, the AC doesn't burn. It's going to leave. It's going to leave the combustion chamber past the O2 sensor. And the O2 is going to pick up on that. Yes, the O2 sensor is going to pick up on it. It's not going to read the gases. It's just going to read the O2. It can read just the oxygen. Yes. So in an ideal, in an ideal world it would be inert gas, right? Yes. Would, yeah. The oxygen sensor would not be picking up large amounts of oxygen. Exactly. That's a, that's a really good way of saying that. Yeah, it's inert gas. Yes. And the O2 won't be picking up on it. It's already burnt already. It's already been used up. Okay. Yeah, it, it, look at the bottom there. It says a worn camshaft load will reduce both lift and duration for its valve. Right. Depending on whether the valve is in an intake or exhaust valve, Airflow into the cylinder or exhaust flow out will be affected. Running compress you can find that during a running compression check. This, this is what we talked about before. Okay. Can load where we talked about that one. A timing belt or timing chain that has slipped will alter valve timing and generally affect all cylinders equally. That we get the low vacuum. That's affect the map sensor. Mm -hmm. Alright, we're gonna stop right here. It's almost nine o'clock. We're gonna stop here. We come back, we're gonna do number 10. Start number 10 slide. I might.